Welcome to Marketplace Tech Bytes, our weekly review of some of the biggest stories making headlines across the industry. I'm Lily Jamali. This week on the show, OpenAI expands its foothold in the corporate office. Data center energy consumption is set to surge. And Gen X and Gen Z enjoy the 80s on TikTok. And joining me to dig into all of that this week is Jewel Burke Solomon. She's a managing partner at Collab Capital. Hey, Jewel, welcome back. Hey, Lily. It's good to be here. It's nice to see you. Uh, we're going to start, as we always do, with our bite of the week. This is a number that gives us a little insight into the week that was in tech. What have you been thinking about this week, Jewel? I have been thinking about 100,000, and that is the number of U.S. and U.K. employees with PricewaterhouseCooper that are now going to be using ChatGPT for enterprise based on a new contract uh, that the two signed this week. Yeah, I love a good segue. So thank you, Jewel. <laughs> <laughs> OpenAI, Open of course, announcing a couple of different partnerships this week, including some with news outlets as well. Um, but this one is different. This one with PwC, which you bring up, the massive consulting firm, one of the big four, as it's known. The Wall Street Journal is reporting the firm will be both OpenAI's largest customer, thanks to that number you quoted, those 100,000 um, workers in the U.S., and the first reseller of OpenAI's enterprise product. Jewel, where do you think OpenAI is hoping to go with this? Total domination, it seems to me. They're really firing on all cylinders, uh, as you noted, getting new clients, not just in enterprise, but also publishers and folks that are um, working in the in the data space as well. And so there's something really interesting happening here. And particularly for me as an investor in early stage startups, I'm tracking this very closely because a lot of startups were building thinking that open AI would stay more on the consumer side mm -hmm. and the research side for a bit longer. Um, but now them going full force into the enterprise with this large partnership with PwC, and I'm sure many more to come, uh, that means that many startups, I'm sure, are going to have to rethink their plans uh, because these companies can now sort of build their own solutions with their own data using OpenAI as a back end. I love this point that you make about this shift now from that emphasis on the consumer to enterprise, because I thought we were all going to be sneaking around using this stuff when our bosses weren't looking, and here <laughs> we are. So we're coming up on a year now since OpenAI launched ChatGPT's enterprise uh, tier, OpenAI said in April that 92% of Fortune 500 companies are using ChatGPT in some form. What we don't know, though, is what kind of engagement we're talking about. What does seem pretty clear here, though, is that this is going to be, at least the way that OpenAI wants things to work out, a big part of how they make money, right? Yes. And we're seeing, we're hearing about, of course, Microsoft is a large investor in open AI, and there may be some pressure from Microsoft to continue to find these commercial applications and, and make more money, of course. And the other thing is that that may be leading to more internal tension. Um, we've seen over the past few weeks, some more shakeups on the leadership side of open AI, um, because, you know, they're making these huge uh, partnership agreements but there's still concerns over safety and the guardrails that are being placed um, internally. So that's something that I think we'll continue to be talking about for weeks and months and years to come. Um, but it's really interesting to watch kind of how things are unfolding at OpenAI. Yeah, never a dull moment on this beat. Uh, from what you just mentioned about those those guardrails, um, where's the oversight and chat GPT uh, is really at the center of that conversation. Open AI trying to make some moves there to at least appease some of the concerns. Um, but then you also have the ScarJo debacle. We're still talking about that from last week. And then Google's uh, AI overview and search is telling us to put glue on pizza. So good times <laughs> all around. As we've talked about in the past, um, AI infrastructure burns through a lot of power and the data center industry is exploding right now to meet that demand. So now we're getting some numbers on what that growth is going to look like in the energy context. As much as 9% of total electricity generated 
in the U.S. could go to data centers by 2030. That would double the current share. What do you make of these projections, which are coming, by the way, from the Electric Power Research Institute, which does get some industry funding? We should mention that. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing to see what those numbers, what they're forecasting those numbers to be. And the question becomes, is it worth it? You know, all of the growth and exciting news around generative AI, we now know that those are the major drivers behind this energy consumption that we'll see over the next 10 years. And, you know, are we ready for this level of consumption? And also the data centers, um, right now, there's very limited availability of, mm-hmm. of spots uh, for all of this. And so now the question is, where are we going to place these data centers? Are we going to be able to retrofit existing data centers to really meet the needs of um, all of these generative AI companies and, and how they're consuming energy? And so uh, there's a lot still to be determined. And I think for us, it's really interesting to see startups that are tackling this particular area. So there's a company I'm mm-hmm. aware of called COI Energy that's thinking about general waste in this space and how to reuse uh, energy that's being wasted for good. I um, mean, other companies are, are kind of taking it from that angle as well. So it's really interesting space and we'll continue to watch and, and see how it progresses. Right. I mean, you asked the question, are we ready? I want to punt a version of that question back at you because with each natural disaster, we see just how vulnerable the nation's grid already is. Um, Should we be worried about this additional strain? I'm sure as an investor, you're thinking about that quite a bit. Absolutely. I mean, I try to be an optimist, but it is concerning when you think about how rapidly um, this energy growth and consumption growth is happening. And again, as not really having the infrastructure today to move as fast as the energy consumption is growing. And so that that is a concern. And I've been thinking about, does this mean we're going to see existing data centers retrofitted uh, to make them more energy efficient than they are right now? Or are we going to be seeing, you know, total redesign of the, the ones that are coming online these next few years so that those are more energy efficient? And, you know, what do we do with those other ones? Um, fascinating stuff. You know, one of these larger data centers uses as much power as 750,000 homes, an astounding statistic when you think about it. Yeah, it's really incredible. And I think to answer the question about will data centers be retrofit to meet the need, I think they will be retrofit to meet meet the need, but there will also be a need for new data centers to come online that are built specifically for these purposes. And so we'll see things like malls that are not being utilized today or other uh, real estate um, places where they're not currently being utilized in the way that the developers would want them to be, likely be used for this purpose in the future. Yeah, really great point. Uh, Keep your eye on commercial real estate and what ideas sprout sprout up there. When to watch. Thank you for that. Um, Well, on to our third and final story. Gen X has arrived on TikTok, thanks in part to a nostalgia trip to the 1980s. We're talking here about uh, Jewel Kids asking their parents to dance like it's the 80s. And we actually have a couple of clips. Uh, Let's watch. That first clip, by the way, is Yini Velasquez, who is credited with kicking off this craze. Her daughter actually uh, has a a good part of the responsibility for making her mom TikTok famous. How can you not smile watching this? Am I alone here? This was so fun. I love this story and just bringing it together. I think there was a, a point in time where it was, okay, Boomer was the the, yeah. the trend. Um, and now this is more delightful and fun for uh, kids and parents to uh, come together over this this dance craze. So it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, just barely not a millennial. I'm technically Gen X, so I'm hoping I can still make some avocado toast jokes. Is that cool? <laughs> um, it does feel like there's some rapprochement here between generations. It's good to see this. Yes, it's it's fun and it's it's kind of interesting. I, I when I saw this, I was like, oh, I wish I was with my mom and could get oh. her to do a little dance uh, in this in this vein. It would be funny, but. Um, You know, it's interesting. It's like we're trying to cram as much fun in on TikTok as we possibly can before any potential bands go down. Um, So this was this was a really cool uh, trend to see. 
Yeah, well, it's a good segue once again. You're uh, two for two here, Jewel. We we do have to squeeze in just a tiny bit of news here. And then we get to watch more of Suzanne Neppe of Highlands Ranch, Colorado, doing the robot. Uh, But we do have this directive now passed by Congress and signed by President Biden in April. ByteDance, the app's Chinese owner, of course, has to sell TikTok uh, or face a ban. January is the deadline for that. I think most of our listeners and viewers are familiar with this, but this week, a U.S. appeals court set a fast-tracked schedule to take up legal challenges brought by TikTok, ByteDance, and also a group of content creators active on the app. They're suing, too. Oral arguments are set for September. You know, you start to realize, Jewel, there's not a lot of time to play with here. Yeah, it's it, time is ticking um, for sure on this. And, you know, you think about 170 million people in the U.S. using TikTok and deriving joy from it. And, and in the case of creators deriving income from it. So there are a lot of parties who don't necessarily want to see this ban take place and are um, all hands on deck to make sure that the arguments are in. So they have a chance of of saving it, if you will. Um, And so it's going to be an interesting summer as these deadlines come about to see kind of where everything lands, where the arguments land and ultimately what the decision is. All right. Well, can we bring up that video of Suzanne Neppe one more time? Uh, Because I did want to mention her daughter. (laughs) Her daughter was commenting on the commitment. I mean, look at that. Yes, I love it. (laughs) And um, again, this, this family is from Highlands Ranch, Colorado. Um, Mary, this woman's daughter, said the trend reminded her that at some point, all of our parents, quote, were just crazy kids dancing their hearts out and having fun. See, parents are people, right? Parents are people too. Yes, love it. You need to remember <laughs> this. All right, Jewel, so much fun to have you back. Thanks for coming on. Thanks so much. That was Jewel Burke Solomon at Collab Capital. Thanks to all of you for watching Marketplace Tech Bytes Week in Review. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to us if you haven't already. We are at Marketplace APM. Daniel Shin produced this episode, and I'm Lily Dramali. This is APM.